From the storytellers at E60, this is E60 Pictures. This thing flakes off very badly. There's no burns on it. There's, you know, this yeah. is an explosion. I know it's pretty crazy, huh? So if you even touch it, you'll get some flakes on your hands. There are some signatures that you can see. I think there's one over here that says "Good Luck Challenger." We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and lift off. Lift off of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye, and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. The memories of this tragedy are all encapsulated in this ball. I often wondered what happened to the ball. If there was any speak left, El would have wanted it to speak. This is the story of an ordinary soccer ball and how it came to go on a most extraordinary journey. A journey that began here, Clear Lake High School in Houston, Texas. Only a mile down the road from NASA's Johnson Space Center, it's not unusual for students here to have a parent who is an astronaut. One of those astronauts was Ellison Onizuka, who joined NASA in 1978. I was very excited for him when he was chosen. And I remember him talking about how, how fortunate he felt. And um, he was a very humbled man at that point. Ours is a land of opportunity where a local boy like me can grow up in the coffee fields of Kona and go on to orbit in the most sophisticated spacecraft this world has ever seen. Originally from Kona, Hawaii, Ellison served as a test pilot in the Air Force before moving to Clear Lake with his wife and two daughters. There was that quiet drive to aspire to something that he felt was pretty untangible, no reachable. By the time Ellison got to NASA, the days of Apollo and landing on the moon were over. That's one small step for man, one it was now the era of the space shuttle. So on January 24th, 1985, Ellison embarked on his first mission aboard the space shuttle Discovery. You know, you're a guest with a mixture of being happy, being scared, and being proud. Not just for the crew, but for the nation of people that were watching it. After three days and 48 orbits of the Earth, Discovery coming down now. Ellison and the crew of the Discovery land safely at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. As the first Asian American in space, Ellison's work was having a global impact. It was a dream come true for me, uh, but I, I think uh, more importantly, uh, it tells the, the children today that, uh, that it is possible. But it was still the simple things in life that he enjoyed most, like spending time with his daughters, Janelle and Darian. When the girls got into sports, he was an avid supporter for the girls' soccer. 
Both my daughters played from a very young age all through high school. He would just do anything for his girls. I mean, as, when he was in town, he was there. Very involved. Nearly a year to the day after his first trip to space, Ellison was scheduled to go back, this time on the Space Shuttle Challenger. After months of training, as the launch approached, Ellison entered quarantine. But he still found a way to get to his daughter's soccer games. None of us would know until we'd see him at the corner of the fence. And he's not supposed to be there. He's supposed to be in quarantine. And he would sneak out just to, just to see a little bit of the game. And then when we'd look up, he'd be gone. Astronauts are given a small allotment for personal items on each flight. So Ellison asked his 16-year-old daughter, Janelle, what he should bring. Her answer, a soccer ball signed by her team. We had bags and bags and bags of those balls. And so, um, who knows, we, we grabbed one that was fairly clean and uh, had it signed. I do remember L coming to the soccer field to get the ball. He was running late and ran out to the field and grabbed the ball from Janelle. Bye, see ya, you know, love you, dad. That was it. At Cape Canaveral today, the Space Shuttle Challenger ran into still more problems, and that forced still another delay in efforts to put the first school teacher into space. January 28th, 1986, Cape Canaveral, Florida. And here comes the flight crew now. Ellison, his six crewmates, including the first civilian astronaut, school teacher, Krista McAuliffe, are ready to launch on the Space Shuttle Challenger. The crew is going to find somewhat of a chilly welcome when they arrive in the cabin. Uh, at launch time, it's still expected to be about 25 degrees. Everybody gets, you know, totally wired as the count gets closer. T minus nine minutes and counting. And then as the count progresses, they put us in an elevator and take us up to the roof. You can see and feel when the thrusters starts lighting up in the rumble. T minus 10, nine, eight, seven, six. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. You know, we were relieved when it said liftoff, and we watch it ascend. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. And uh, that one was very different. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. They snatched us up quickly off the roof, put us back into the elevator, ran us downstairs. Purses, cameras, everything were all left. Kids were crying. From there it was Kind of a blur, but uh, something that takes a while to sink in. In what appears to be a major catastrophe in America's space program, 
Challenger, only seconds after leaving the launch pad, according to NASA, has exploded in midair. I was numbed. Uh, they said I passed out. And when they made the announcement that the crew was lost, I slipped down. I just kind of slithered down to the floor. But the back of my head hit the light switch, and the whole place went dark. At that very moment, all the lights went out because all the lights did go out in all of us. All seven astronauts aboard the Challenger were killed. Three days later, Ellison and his crewmates were honored at Johnson Space Center. The sacrifice of your loved ones has stirred the soul of our nation. A presidential commission later determined that the record cold temperatures at launch caused the failure of a quarter inch rubber O-ring. As a result, 73 seconds after takeoff, the adjacent fuel tank leaked, causing catastrophic failure. Recovering the wreckage from Challenger was the largest underwater salvage operation in U.S. history. Pulling nearly 14 tons of debris out of the Atlantic Ocean. I was told that there were nine items of Elle's personal flight kit that, that floated up to the surface. One was a soccer ball. We're doing very limited recovery now so that we can go out there with other assets and do a full photo documentation for isolating the problem that caused the failure of 51L. Actually, it's important that we bring all of these O-rings and these clevis material up to the surface. Despite the largest underwater salvage operation in U.S. history, more than half the debris from the Space Shuttle Challenger was never found. But among the items recovered from the wreckage were some of astronaut Ellison Onizuka's personal belongings. I was told that there were nine items of Elle's personal flight kit that, that floated up to the surface. One was a soccer ball. Ellison's soccer ball, signed by his daughter and her teammates, was found inside a bag floating in the Atlantic, one of the only items recovered completely intact. It was still very, very vibrant. I was just very surprised that um, that it floated up and they found it. The ball was given back to Ellison's wife, Lorna, who returned it to Clear Lake High School. I wouldn't have wanted to become a recovered artifact sitting in a locked vault somewhere, archived forever. Uh, if there was any speak left, El would have wanted it to speak. But time persisted. 14 years passed, all the while, the ball faded into the background, forgotten. That is until the fall of 2000. Rotate, let's go quick. All right, that way when you strike the ball, your foot is going forward. When newly hired soccer coach Jared Shriver, who grew up here as the son of an astronaut, 
and whose father flew with Ellison on the space shuttle Discovery, found something in the athletic room. I was walking around back there and I was getting something out of a filing cabinet and there was an old soccer ball and it was just sitting there, unkept, unnoticed, and there's a message on the ball. It says, good luck, and I realized what the ball was. This is an artifact from Space Shuttle Challenger. This is one of the few things that was recovered. This is, this is a national treasure. After Shriver's discovery, the ball was added to a collection of NASA memorabilia on display in a school hallway. Literally thousands of people walked by it every day and probably had no idea what it was. There was no real publicity about the ball. There was no hype that this thing existed. And for a while, it seemed that was the end of the journey for the ball until January of 2016, when new principal Karen Engel learned of its story. I walked immediately out to that ball and it's on the bottom shelf. I sat down and just looked at it and literally started tearing up, thinking that this ball had survived that horrific accident and was sitting in our front entryway and you didn't even know it. Around that same time, astronaut Shane Kimbrough, also a Clear Lake parent, was preparing for his second mission to the International Space Station. We get to take up a few things with us when we go to space. Um, I reached out to the principal just to say, hey, is there anything you'd like me to take up from the high school? She brought up the idea of, of taking the soccer ball to space, and of course I was like, absolutely, um, no problem at all. I'd be honored to do that. But before the ball could go to space, it had to fit in a compartment roughly the size of a shoebox, along with Kimbrough's personal items. I said, Jared, listen, I think we need to deflate it. And who better to deflate the soccer ball than the soccer coach? <sighs> okay. I was nervous, I was sweating, and for a second I thought I had screwed the ball up, but I, I hadn't, and I was able to deflate it. It's, oh, see, like that, right there. We don't want that. Nine months later, Kimbrough and the soccer ball traveled to the International Space Station where 254 miles above the Earth, a journey that started more than three decades ago, was finally complete. It was a bit emotional and just thinking about, you know, where this came from and what had happened and what had transpired over these many years to get to that point. started thinking about their family and what it meant to them. And as a result, you know, took some pictures and sent some down to them. On January 28, 2017, 31 years to the day after the Challenger tragedy, Shane Kimbrough posted this picture online. It was hard to fathom, in a sense. You know, for me, it was a little bit of an old ache that comes back. Uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's all the feelings that I felt when Al flew. Happy, uh, gratified, thankful, very thankful that it's uh, finally made its way to where Al would have wanted it to go. The ball would spend 173 days in space, orbiting the Earth nearly 3,000 times before returning safely. But there was one more step until its mission would be complete. 
This ball has been on quite a journey, over 73 million miles. Thirty-one years after the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, a soccer ball carried on board by astronaut Ellison Onizuka, signed by his daughter and her teammates, had finally reached its intended destination. 254 miles above the Earth. It was hard to fathom, in a sense. You know, for me, it was a little bit of an old ache that comes back. Uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's all the feelings that I felt when Al flew. Happy, uh, gratified, thankful, very thankful that it's uh, finally made its way to where Al would have wanted it to go. The ball would spend 173 days in space, orbiting the Earth nearly 3,000 times before returning safely. But there was one more step until its mission would be complete. For Al, it would have been unfinished business. As, so I had to finish as well as I could. So my obligation and responsibility was to take it back to where we got it from. November 3rd, 2017, Challenger Columbia Memorial Stadium in Houston, Texas. For the first time, together in one place, are all the people who helped carry this ordinary soccer ball on its most extraordinary journey. This ball has been on quite a journey, over 73 million miles. On behalf of my family, uh, we'd like to now return the ball to Clear Lake High School. The ball's journey ends here, inside the halls of Clear Lake High School. The students who passed by it were born nearly two decades after the disaster that transformed it. But the ball's meaning is not lost. I hope there's just a takeaway. It's been on a journey that you may not get to go on, but it's here and what you do means something. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God.